The 2023 animated television show Scavenger's Reign follows the remaining crew of a crashed spaceship as they attempt to survive on an alien world. The characters begin the show scattered across the planet Vesta, and must all make the trek to the wreck of their ship, the Demeter, if they're to have any chance of getting home alive. Ursula and Sam must learn to rely on one another. Ozzy must learn to rely on the robot Levi, who's never had much of an option but to rely on her. Cayman has only himself and what he finds in the woods. I can lay it all out like this now, but I was multiple episodes into my first viewing before I could have told you any of the characters' names. Their solitude is such that there isn't need for them. There's no one to speak with or speak of. Names can be complicated anyway. Ozzy calls her companion Levi like it's her name, but we soon learn that's what this type of robot is called. She is a Levi. Her name is not hers, it's a marker of her purpose, her job, her non-personhood. She's a tool. When she shows signs of individuality, it's a glitch that must be corrected. Even Levi's voice does not belong to her. Do you remember her, Fiona? The person who programmed you? Of course. You actually do remind me of her. Maybe it's just because you have the same voice. Fiona was also Cayman's ex. She died in the crash. Now, on the planet, he falls prey to an animal that hunts via mind control, who uses his memories of her as both carrot and stick. This creature is apparently called the Hollow, though I don't think those words are ever spoken aloud in the show. What would it need with a name, anyway? Cayman caused the crash. He redirected the ship's course, knowing it could be dangerous. But it was take this risky shortcut or lose his job. It was wrong of him, and it was also him doing what was expected. The corporation running this mission, who created the systemic incentives that led to this decision, are at least as responsible for the deaths of everyone aboard as Cayman is. With no one but the Hollow to turn to, no idea if rescue is coming, Cayman retreats into the past, wallows in the hallucinations the creature feeds him. Eventually, he allows the Hollow to envelop him entirely. The image of his body's integration with the animal is fetal. He is returning as far back in life as he can, to before anything had hurt him. The gestalt that emerges from this union, a hollow now larger than the rest of its species, is the trauma of the crash, is the life the protagonists have left behind, the complex ways that these things are interconnected. It hunts the survivors across the landscape. The hollow hears Fiona's voice, the representative of all good things now lost to Cayman, and can hear only her. In its quest to find her, in its anger at her absence, it nearly destroys the new thing Levi is becoming. The claustrophobia of the starship Demeter and the wild terror of the planet's surface form a dichotomy rooted in the long history of the ways that nature as a concept has been constructed. A major piece of writing on this subject is William Cronin's article, The Trouble with Wilderness. Notably, for our purposes, Cronin points out, in virtually all of its manifestations, wilderness represents a flight from history. Seen as the bold landscape of frontier heroism, it is a place of youth and childhood into which men escape by abandoning their past and entering a world of freedom, where the constraints of civilization fade into memory. Seen as the sacred sublime, it is the home of a god who transcends history by standing as the one who remains untouched and unchanged by time's arrow. No matter what the angle from which we regard it, wilderness offers us the illusion that we can escape the cares and troubles of the world in which our past has ensnared us. There are shades of these visions of wilderness in Scavenger's Reign, but in the end, the escape from the past proves a false one. Ursula, Ozzy, and Levi must confront the crashed Demeter and the hollow beast that awaits them there. One would think that in leaving behind so-called civilization, the characters would lose access to its technologies, but this is not quite the case. Vesta teems with vines that function as wires, and fish that work as gas masks. In this world, technology emerges as a natural part of the ecosystem. It must have taken effort, taken weeks of trial and error, to learn how best to make use of these things, but it does not require foundries or factories or production pipelines. At least in wealthy countries like the US, technology often comes to us as extant objects without history or context. This is an illusion, but a comforting one. If we do not acknowledge that a smartphone is a physical thing composed of metal and minerals fashioned in a particular way, we do not have to think about the labor that went into fashioning them. I think this is more or less what Marxists refer to as commodity fetishism, but reading Capital is a bit outside the scope of the research I was planning to do for this video. 
So instead, I turn us to another treatise on the nature of nature, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, where she too reflects on the provenance of everyday objects. I twirl a pencil, a magic wand lathed from incense cedar between my fingers, the willow bark and the aspirin. Even the metal of my lamp asks me to consider its roots in the strata of the earth. But I notice that my eyes and my thoughts pass quickly over the plastic on my desk. I hardly give the computer a second glance. I can muster no reflective moment for plastic. It is so far removed from the natural world. And yet I mean no disrespect for the diatoms and marine invertebrates who 200 million years ago lived well and fell to the bottom of an ancient sea, where under great pressure of a shifting earth they became oil that was pumped from the ground to a refinery where it was broken down and then polymerized to make the case of my laptop or the cap of the aspirin bottle. But being mindful in the vast network of hyper-industrialized goods really gives me a headache. We weren't made for that sort of constant awareness. The biotechnology of Vesta presents a have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too fantasy, where we can know the context of our tech because the context is immediately knowable. This fish is a fish. This vine is a vine. Even if you kill them in the process of using them, that can't be more objectionable than killing them to eat. Scavenger's Reign began as a short film titled Just Scavengers. The short is all action, no dialogue, and follows two characters, nameless here, though they read to me as early drafts of Sam and Ursula, as they perform a Rube Goldberg machine of scavenging tasks. After enormous effort, they reach the goal of their day's work, a vision of Earth. It is through their knowledge of the non-human world that they are able to access this connection to something that feels lost to them. The two are tangled up in one another. When it comes to the way our culture constructs wilderness, I think a lot about a piece I read years ago about nature documentaries. The author Emma Maris explains the perhaps obvious and retrospect fact that the images documentaries show us of untouched nature are in fact artificial. Roads and cities and camera gear all just out of frame. Scavengers reigns, lingering shots of animals scampering through trees or devouring one another one carefully drawn frame at a time do feel rather like scenes from a nature documentary. Which makes it all the more interesting when Maris writes, As an environmental journalist, I've had the extremely good fortune to go to some of the kinds of places where they film nature documentaries. I've been in the Amazon, days from the nearest road. I've seen humpback whales feeding groups by weaving together nets of bubbles. I've watched Tasmanian devils sunbathe and snorkeled with sea turtles. But when I watch BBC documentaries about those places and those animals, I don't feel like I've returned to those moments. Instead, I feel like I've entered a fantasy. This show does not take place on planet Earth. It is a fantasy, albeit one grounded in a certain kind of sideways truth. If we do find extrasolar ecosystems one day, they won't include humans. It's hard to argue such science is relevant, though, when humans seem to slot into this alien ecosystem without issue. In real life, parasites hyper-specialize to particular host species. The ones here dig their tendrils into the newly arrived humans in an instant. And I could call this a failure to reflect a biological truth, but I'd rather see it as dedication to depicting a different one. The wilderness of Vesta is not an untouched terra nullius. Scavenger's reign refuses the easy dichotomies and asks us to contend with a more nuanced, more accurate understanding of nature, one which humans are always already a part of. Towards the end of the show, Sam becomes infected. A strange, spidery thing takes up residence in his heart. It alters his behavior, reorients his priorities around its own continued life cycle. And for a while, he doesn't even know it. The horror of parasitism is the reminder of not just mortality, but the sheer fact of biology. All of our hopes and dreams and heartbreaks are physiological, electrochemical reactions. To contend with the parasitic is to understand that humans are animals. As science writer Carl Zimmer puts it in his book Parasite Rex, when an alien bursts out of a movie actor's chest, it bursts through our pretenses to be more than brilliant creatures. The last stage in the life cycle of the parasite that kills Sam roots the host in place, a tiny part of a larger organism, manipulated like a puppet, the way they were all along. The soil here is dead. Nothing can grow here, but look, these crystal structures poke through and part the soil, and climb towards the sky to create a home for whatever those things are. My feeling right now is that I am that soil." Sam, by the end, feels he is not an active participant in his life, but a tool for some other thing to use. Around this time, someone answers the distress call Ozzy has been sending out. 
They are not, though, well-intentioned rescuers, but instead are here because they know whatever is left on that wrecked spaceship will be valuable. They are, in a word, scavengers. The word itself, if you trace it far enough back, comes from the same source as the verb to show, related not to finding things, but to seeing them, inspecting them, examining them. The title then takes on a double meaning. The protagonists are scavengers in that they must take from the land to survive, but they are also scavengers in this archaic sense, taking in information, learning the world they've found themselves in by observation. These new scavengers have a different point of view. Cronin writes that before the environmentalist movement, before the colonial veneration of wilderness as frontier, many of the word's strongest associations were biblical, for it is used over and over again in the King James Version to refer to places on the margins of civilization where it is all too easy to lose oneself in moral confusion and despair. Wilderness, in short, was a place to which one came only against one's will, and always in fear and trembling. Whatever value it might have arose solely from the possibility that it might be reclaimed and turned toward human ends. Chris, the leader of this crew of scavengers, is old-fashioned in this way. She comments to Ozzy at one point, Good thing we found you. People can lose their minds on places like this. And in a way, she's right. It wouldn't be unreasonable to characterize Cayman or Sam by the end as having lost their minds. But couldn't the same be said of Ursula? Again and again, she's taken in by the wonders around her. She feels a sense of possibility here. At one point, she stops in the middle of a thicket to watch a tiny creature bloom before her eyes. Sam berates her, afterward, for risking her safety. From her point of view, though, he's the one hemmed in by the mindset of the world they've left behind. Hypothetically speaking, in our contracts, could we charge the last couple of months as overtime? <laughs> But seriously. Nevi perhaps experiences what Ursula does to an even greater degree. We learn belatedly that she was experiencing strange visions, waking dreams whispered to her by the planet itself. This white flower is an image repeated across the show, synecdoche for Vesta as a whole. The first time we see one, it's sprouting from an animal's corpse. New life grows from death. That's how ecosystems function. Another one of these same flowers grows from the floor of the Demeter. Even here, amid the ruins of industry, there is life and possibility. The youngest of the crew of scavengers admires the white petals. Chris tells him, Pick it. She cannot conceive of value that does not translate into something she can own. Back during the Demeter's journey, Ozzy bonded with a woman named Mia. Unloading the cargo, and then on to the next one. Must get kind of lonely. Yeah, I guess. It suits me, though. At least... I used to think it did. This conversation paints a vivid picture of who Ozzy was. An obedient robot with no need of connection to anything beyond herself. After she loses Mia, and then loses Levi, Chris tempts her to sink back into these old ways. These people, these strangers, their weight dragging you down. Chris is a product of her environment. As much as Ozzy, as much as Cayman. She explains that she used to work for a corporation, but now she and her crew are independent from them. But she replicates the same cold capitalist logic that marooned the crew of the Demeter here. When one of her own people is mortally injured, she kills him herself. It was mercy. It isn't even that she's wrong. It's believable that Terence wasn't going to survive. But he was only alone and unprotected in the first place because of problems she caused. He wouldn't have had to die if they'd all been able to trust one another from the start. Ozzy had been making her SOS calls for a while, but the one that Chris and the others respond to is the one that she makes after, as far as she's aware, Levi has died. She reaches out for help, and the only kind that's offered is that of the scavenger's mercenary cruelty. People turn to corrupt systems out of genuine need. Earlier in the series, a storm forces the characters to take refuge. Ursula and Sam wind up riding inside a large sea creature, watching the world pass by through its translucent skin. They parasitize it. Reading about parasites at length, the horror faded. Parasite Rex overflows with step-by-step -step walkthroughs of a given parasite's life cycle from its own point of view, with character sketches of scientists absolutely enamored with these creatures. At a certain point, it's hard to see them as anything but a kind of animal like any other. Yes, they can kill, but so can a predator. I might not want to meet a tiger in the wild, but I'm not horrified by their mere existence. Ozzy and Levi grow closer as they travel. Ozzy learns to trust that which she does not understand. Before that, though, she's intent on investigating what is happening to Levi. 
the strange fungus that has infected her circuits and seems to have granted her sentience. You are touching me with your hand. What's it feel like? Nice. Gay people can never just flirt normally. Pain and disease are natural, but so too is pleasure. And as much as I'll joke about this being sexual, the thing it's paralleled with is Levi helping cut Ozzy's hair. Ozzy feels kind of nice when you do that, Levi. <laughs> a quiet, casual kind of intimacy. Levi is alive, but she is not human. She is something altogether new, both a part of the planet and her own thinking autonomous being. Her transition from lifeless metal to something else is defined by, more than anything, its own inexplicability. Time and again, Ozzy asks her why she's done something, and she's unable to explain herself. Life and emotions and love do not follow straightforward cause and effect logic. At one point in Braiding Sweetgrass, Kimura relates an anecdote of a time she was facilitating a creative writing workshop, and the students professed without reservation that they loved the Earth. And then I asked them, do you think that the Earth loves you back? No one was willing to answer that. Here was a room full of writers, passionately wallowing in unrequited love of nature. So I made it hypothetical and asked, what do you suppose would happen if people believed this crazy notion that the Earth loved them back? The floodgates opened. They all wanted to talk at once. We were suddenly off the deep end, heading for world peace and perfect harmony. When Ozzy is injured by floating spores, she finds relief in a nearby pond where fish gather and nibble the inflammation from her skin. These fish have evolved to feed off of this particular injury. Here is a kind of organism as technology we haven't discussed up to this point. One that is symbiotic, beneficial not just to the human, but to every being involved. Both the ship and the planet in this show are named from Greco-Roman mythology. Their ship was the Demeter, goddess of agriculture, a fitting name for something defined by business and production. But the planet is not named for wildness or danger, not the other side of some wilderness civilization binary. Vesta is the goddess of the hearth, of home. Mm -hmm.